Welcome once again to A Look Ahead. We're so glad you've decided to join us. We, of course, are looking at what we call the Sabbath School Lesson, a series on the Book of Galatians that we're studying right now. And this is lesson number seven, entitled The Road to Faith. Our friends will be studying this on November 12 of 2011. And I would like to begin, as usual, with a word of prayer. Would you bow your head with us? Our kind and loving Father, we thank you so much for the wonderful messages, for the explanations that you have given us in your scriptures. As we study them, as we open them, help us to gain the insights we need to become more like you is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. This time we'll be looking at particularly Galatians 3, 21 to 25. And some of you are aware, I'm sure, that this has become a very hotly debated and contested portion of Scripture. So we'll see what we can make of it. This lesson, once again, focuses on the relationship between the law, and this case is between the law and the gospel. This relationship is crucial for Christians. Some Christians believe that the law is no longer in effect. Others act almost as if the law is the whole story. So where is the truth? Has God given us clear instructions about the plan of salvation? Historically, God's covenant or promise to Abraham preceded the giving of the law on Sinai by some 430 years. We've already seen that the latter, given the later giving of a law, could never nullify or change the promise given many years earlier. God does not change. And there's a couple of places where that's stated quite specifically. Look, for example, at 1 Samuel 15:29. Israel's majestic God does not lie or change his mind. He's not a human being, suggesting that we change our minds quite a lot, right? He does not change his mind. And then a more familiar, perhaps, passage is Malachi 3, verse 6. I am the Lord, I do not change. And so you, the descendants of Jacob, are not completely lost because he had promised to them, hadn't he? So... It is true that by taking some verses out of the Old Testament, it might seem like you could be saved by keeping the law. Some examples are Leviticus 18.5, where it says, Follow the practices and the laws that I give you. You will save your life by doing so. I am the Lord. Now, doesn't that sound like you could be saved by keeping the law? And what about Deuteronomy 6.24? Then the Lord our God commanded us to obey all these laws and to honor him. If we do, he will always watch over our nation and keep it prosperous. Okay? Other passages suggest the same thing. Now, we know that God is the only source of life. No, not only physically, but also spiritually. And there's lots of verses supporting that idea. 2 Kings 5.7, Nehemiah 9.6. John 5, 21, and even Romans 4, 17. The law was never intended to give life. Okay? That's one of the points we want to make here. Several places in the scriptures very clearly point out that we are all sinners. 1 Kings 8, 46. 2 Chronicles 6, 36. Ecclesiastes 7, 20. Romans 3, 23. And that's the famous one, you know, that most people know. But also 1 John 1, 9 and 10. One of the best summaries of this whole idea is found in Romans 3. Let's look at that for just a moment. Romans 3, and I'm going to start with verse 9. Well then, are we Jews in any better condition than the Gentiles? Not at all. I have already shown that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under the power of sin. As the scripture says, there is no one who is righteous, no one who is wise or who worships God. All have turned away from God. They have all gone wrong. No one does right not even one, and it goes on with that same kind of an idea. And then, of course, the famous verse, which I probably should read, verse 23, everyone has sinned and is far away from God's saving presence. So, from a scriptural point of view, at least, we all must admit that we're sinners. Okay? So that's our starting point. We are a bunch of sinners. Uh, Paul correctly states that the sin problem begins in human hearts. So how is the problem to be resolved? Well, when we get to Romans 8, verse 3, it says just plainly, God dealt with sin. He did away with sin by sending His Son. 
Now, how does that work? Well, coming back to the law, God has given us the law to spell out sin. From the days of Adam outside the gates of the Garden of Eden, the sacrificial system was intended to teach us that sin leads to death. The law helps us to identify those, danger, those dangerous, death-dealing behaviors. Do we as human beings need such guidance? What do you think? Obviously, the, certainly the children at Mount Sinai, the children of Israel at Mount Sinai needed it. And but we don't we need it. We probably need it too. Probably? I think we need it. Well, after we're convinced that we're sinners, what happens next? We go to Jesus, confess okay. our sins. Mm -hmm. Well, we look for the remedy first. Okay. Somebody's, and we've got to find it. So the, the plan of salvation gives us an opportunity to have our sins forgiven, right? And our Certainly. lives changed eventually to have a place in God, with God in heaven? So how do we cooperate with God so this life-changing experience can happen? Do we still need the law? Or could we just follow the example of Christ? Well, we're supposed to do what's right because it is right, not because the law tells us to. The example of Christ was rather than to displease or dishonor his father by breaking even one of the commandments, he died on a cross says he was obedient even unto death. Mm -hmm. We need both, I would say. Both of those go together. Follow his example and mind the law. Well, here's our passage. Let's read it, the passage we're supposed to be focusing on today. Starting with verse 19 of Galatians 3, what then was the purpose of the law? It was added in order to show what wrongdoing is. Do we need that direction? And it was meant to last until the coming of Abraham's descendant, whom the promise was made. The law was handed down by angels with a man acting as a go-between. But a go-between is not needed when only one person is involved and God is one. So what's the purpose of the law? Does this mean that the law is against God's promises? And Paul says, no, not at all. For if human beings had received a law that could bring life, then everyone could be put right with God by obeying it. But the scripture says that the whole world is under the power of sin. And so the gift which is promised on the basis of faith in Jesus Christ is given to those who do what? Have faith or believe. But before the time for faith came, the law kept us all locked up as prisoners until this coming faith should be revealed. And so the law was in charge of us until Christ came in order that we might then be put right with God through faith. Now that the time for faith is here, the law is no longer in charge of us. Now, isn't that pretty clear that the law has been done away with? Doesn't it sound like that? Sounds like it. Well, Paul was addressing the formerly Jewish Christians in Galatia, right? He talked about conditions as they were before the coming of Christ. What does it mean to be kept under the law? Well, we got to remember, too, to keep in context that, that these people came in and said that you have to keep the Jewish law in order to be saved. Um, right. And that's, that's really what he's trying to, he's trying to get at that that's not so. That's not so. So... Um, we don't have to keep the law. Well, the circumcision, um, you know, things like that, um, but but obviously he was really riled up because of this, because of of what they claimed that you needed to do to be saved, not only be a Christian, but you had to do the things of the the Jewish um, laws. Mm -hmm. So somehow he's he's trying to to um, prove that isn't so. Okay. But but yet at the same time the law has to be fulfilled. Look at Galatians 4.21. What does this suggest about being under the law? Let me ask those of you who want to be subject to the law, do you not hear what the law says? So in that context, subject to the law, what would subject to the law me mean there in that, in that, that verse? 
subject to the law. That means that means they they believe in its power to save, wouldn't you think? The law's power to save? Yeah, when you're subject to the law. If you're subject to the law, you are required to go along with it, to obey it. Okay. So one of the meanings of under law would be that you think that you need to observe all of it. And would that include all the extra rules that the Pharisees had made? In some opinion. Was the law, was the keeping of the law ever intended by God to be a way of salvation? No. No. I mean, if you take that approach, you're basically saying, we don't need Jesus Christ, right? Right. Well, another meaning of under the law is to be under the condemnation of the law because we have broken it. As sinners, we are all under the law in that sense. If by looking at the law we recognize our sinfulness, we should then turn to God for the gospel. So if you look in the mirror and you see your face is dirty, you go away and say, well, that's okay. So long as I, the mirror's not here, it doesn't matter because I can't see it, right? And you can walk around with a dirty face, it won't matter, right? You're talking about the law <laughs> being some sort of light bulb? I'm talking about the law being some kind of a mirror. A mirror. There's a place here in Galatians, Galatians 4, chapter 4, though we're not on that, chapter 21 and all the way through 31, where it speaks about Hagar being as a bondwoman and Sarah being as a free woman through the promise. Right. Uh, Obviously, Hagar was not a Jew. No. Sarah was. Yes. And well, they weren't, none of them were technically Jews because Jews are descendants of Judah, and Judah didn't come along. He was a great grandson of Abraham. So you can't technically call any of them Jews. Each woman, though, don't they represent like two different parties? Yeah. One obedient, that, in that sense, one yes. a bondwoman who is, bo you know, a She's under sin, she is a sinner, and the other one is free because she's obedient to the law. Therefore, that makes her free, free from okay. sin. But still, I come back to the, the issue, of, do you have to be a Jew to be saved? Well, that was one of the questions. That was one of the major questions here in, in Galatia. Do you need to, do you need to? I mean, if, if that was true, you wouldn't need Jesus in the first place. All you have to do is go out and convert everybody to become Jews. So there's got to well, be something There's a little problem different. with that, and that's what we already said. The problem with it is that we can't keep the law. Well, that's true. That's true. Absolutely. So here's a, but, here's but a, here's a plan back, over here. Yeah. And so people are rushing over there and said, this looks good, great, let's do it. And it turns out it doesn't work. So do you want to be in that plan that doesn't work? It doesn't work because no one can do it. Uh, exactly. That's what we said earlier. But the point is it doesn't work. So why would it be done in the first place then? Well, I don't think the law was ever intended to be a means of salvation. Right. But it's there to, it points out sin. But it does a good job of that. But isn't that in the Old Testament what they, the people thought they had to obey or...? Well, I mean, if we obey it, then you're, you avoid sin, right? That's a good idea. But it doesn't mean, it, the law doesn't, it isn't a means of salvation. So it was just like for guidelines, that's how they looked at it back in the Old Testament? I think so. Well, there may have been a step, though, that God was showing them that they can't keep the law. He might have, he might have said, okay, go for it, keep it. Mm -hmm. And it actually... When you read part of the Bible, it looks like they were going for it. Mm -hmm. But then after a while, it became clear that they can't keep the law. So there's a process going here as far as understanding goes. Well, let's talk about what the law does. In Galatians 3, 23 and 24, where we just read a moment ago, it says these things. First of all, the law is to keep us or guard us. Then, too, it is confines us or encloses us in our sinful condition by pointing out where we have failed to keep the law. The law is very good at showing us, if we are honest at looking at it, that we are all sinners. I, 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 don't, I don't think anybody would argue at that point. Which says we can't change. 
No, I didn't itself. say that. I'm saying if you look at the law and, and you're, you're willing to interpret it liberally, you know, in, in the spirit of the law, I mean, any sin basically is covered. That isn't what you just read, though. What you just read, though, was that we are basically sinners. We're stuck there as yeah. sinners. Yeah. Without Jesus, we are. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not talking about the solution still. I'm talking about whether the law actually points out our sins. Yes, it does. Okay. So we're not saying that there's a problem with the law. Paul clearly believed that the law was good. Many verses, Romans 7, 12, and 14, 8, 3, and 4, 13, 8, lots of places Paul says the law was good. Um, and number three, in these verses in Galatians 3, 23, and 24, the law becomes a kind of babysitter, a guard, a protector, and even a disciplinarian until we can come to understand the purpose of the law. Well, so the question is, can good things be misused? Absolutely. Drugs that are intended to relieve pain legitimately for patients who are in severe pain can become addicting and even kill people if they're abused. Sharp knives, where essential for many purposes, can be used to kill. The law meant to point out sin and direct us to the Savior could cause us to become discouraged and give up completely. And that would be a misuse of the law, right? Well, if you remember that final presentation that Moses gave to the children of Israel, Deuteronomy 27 and 28, God spelled out some very specific instructions to the children of Israel, describing blessings and curses associated with obedience and disobedience respectfully. As we know, many years later, the Pharisees, seeking ways to make sure that they kept the law in every detail, spelled these details out minutely multiplying laws with almost innumerable do's and don'ts. Jesus clearly pointed out the errors of this approach, and let's just look at that for a moment. Look at Mark 7. Some Pharisees and teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus. They noticed that some of his disciples were eating their food with hands that were ritually unclean. Imagine it. That is, they had not washed them in the way the Pharisees said people should. Now, I would just like to point out that if you really were serious about keeping all the pharisaical rules, all the rules that the Pharisees thought you were supposed to, to keep, it was basically a full-time job. You, you, you couldn't earn a living. You, you, you spent all your time sort of keeping the rules. So you have to be independently wealthy in order to even think about being a Pharisee. And then it goes on here, Jesus says, for the Pharisees as well as the rest of the Jews follow the teaching they receive from their ancestors. They do not eat unless they wash their hands in the proper way, nor do they eat anything that comes from the market unless they wash it first. And they follow many other rules which they have received, such as the proper way to wash cups, pots, copper bowls, and beds. So the Pharisees and the teachers of the law asked Jesus, why is it that your disciples do not follow the teaching handed down by our ancestors, but instead eat with ritually unclean hands? Jesus answered them, how right Isaiah was when he prophesied about you. You are hypocrites, just as he wrote. These people, says God, honor me with their words, but their heart is really far away from me. It is no use for them to worship me because they teach human law and rules as though they were God's laws. You put aside God's command and obey human teachings. Pretty serious comments, right? Uh, now you're talking about added human teachings right there but um, but Paul's kind of zeroing in on the law that was given by God to the Jews mm -hmm. so is there a difference there yeah yeah uh, and I'm not, I'm not sure what your question is perhaps I didn't understand it properly well the difference between what well, I'm trying to find out what the point of that is, is to even bring it up. Is it, is it just that um, laws, any laws, is, is going to, to get I salvation see. from them, is going to come from men and well, not from God? Uh, let's, be, let's take the obvious point. Jesus is saying that you, you don't have to keep all those myriad rules they had made, and he even later pointed out 
some that were clearly contrary to God's law, directly contrary. Honor your father and your mother is one of the Ten Commandments, the fifth command, what we call the fifth commandment. And they said, no, you don't have, to, if you dedicate, you have a piece of property, and that piece of property actually belongs to your parents, but it's time for them to deed it to you, and you decide that, that you're going to give it to the church, then it's your personal property to use, and you can throw your parents out. It's your personal property to use until you die, and then it goes to the church. They call that Corban. Corban? That's just an example, how you could dishonor your parents by so-called keeping the rules. So, and that property passing to you, you were supposed to, you were, uh, the child was the social security system. The, right supposed to support the parents in their old age. Mm -hmm. so. And they're saying that the way it was being used by some, it basically just left the parents out in, in a lurch. They had nothing. Well, one of the effects of all these multiplied rules was to produce a huge wall or barrier between the Jewish nation and the nations around them, to whom they were supposed to be reaching out. God's original promise to Abraham was supposed to be shared with the world. We, we, we read that, Genesis 12, Verse 3, it's a, Abraham was supposed to be a blessing to all nations. But the Jewish people wanted to claim all the blessings without shouldering any of the responsibilities. That's one of the major messages of the Old Testament. They believed that God's blessings were exclusively for them. Well, in Galatians 3.24, Paul uses a very interesting word to describe the law. You've probably all heard pastors talk about this. The Greek word paidagogos has been translated as schoolmaster, disciplinarian, tutor, trainer, teacher, guide, the one in charge of us, a slave to look after us, even custodian, babysitter, child conductor, or guardian. I mean, how many more choices do you need? Well, look at these comments from our Bible study guide. The paidagogos was a slave in Roman society who was placed in a position of authority over his master's sons from the time they turned six or seven, and that was the point at which they were taken away from mom, basically, until they reached maturity. In addition to providing for his charges physical needs, such as drawing their bath, providing them with food and clothes, and protecting them from any danger, the Pythagogos also was responsible for making sure the master's sons went to school and did their homework. Some of you who have children kind of wish you had one of those, right? Take care of the kids and make sure they do their homework. In addition, he was expected not only to teach and practice moral virtues, but also to ensure that the boys learned and practiced the virtues themselves. These paidagogoi, that's a plural, tended to be very strict disciplinarians. They did not hesitate to whip or cane their subjects. Does this imply a negative picture of the law? Well, it certainly could. Does the law rebuke and condemn us as sinners by pointing out our sins? It does, doesn't it? So, which law is primarily being spoken about here in this context? We're back to that question, which you haven't really resolved yet. It sounds like the moral law. Well, it is very clear um, from Ellen White's writings in, in 1SM 233 and 234 that while all law serves the function to a certain degree, it is especially the moral law which Paul was speaking about. Because that's what points out our sins, right? The law has a function very similar to that of a mirror. It can even function as a magnifying glass. It makes our sins, trespasses, and mistakes very apparent. But it's not the purpose of the law to correct these errors. The plan of salvation given by God provides a way for us to leave those errors behind by following Christ. First of all, God wants to open our eyes, and then He encourages us to turn and run to Him for help and salvation. We need the law to help us clarify what is right and what is wrong. But God never intended for us to stop there. So, what is the purpose of the law even from the Old Testament? Show transgression, show yeah. sin. But the Holy Spirit does that too. He yes. convicts us in our conscience. There's a very interesting passage that I've almost never heard anybody refer to, found in Deuteronomy 17, starting with verse 14. It talks about how Scripture is supposed to be used. 
After you have taken possession of the land that the Lord your God is going to give you and have settled there, then you will decide you need a king like all the nations around you. Did they do that? Yes. They did, didn't they? Mm -hmm. Make sure that the man you choose to be king is the one whom the Lord has chosen. He must be one of your own people. Do not make a foreigner your king. The king is not to have a large number of horses for his army. He is not to send people to Egypt to buy horses because the Lord has said that his people are never to return there. The king is not to have many wives. Does this remind you of anybody? Because this would make him turn away from the Lord and he is not to make himself rich with silver and gold. When he becomes king, he is to have a copy of the book of God's laws. Now, what would that be? The those would be the books of Moses primarily, wouldn't they? And teachings made from the original copy kept by the Levitical priests. He is to keep this book near him and read it all, read from it all his life so that he will learn to honor the Lord and to obey faithfully everything that is commanded in it. This will keep him from thinking that he is better than his fellow Israelites and from disobeying the Lord's commands in any way. Then he will reign for many years and his descendants will rule Israel for many years generations. Does that sound like a good use of, of the law? Before you go away from that, why weren't they to have horses? I mean, kings love horses. They're yeah. the great show. They're yeah. well, That's probably Egypt. part of the problem. Not from <coughs> Egypt. When they go to war. Is it, is it because they were the offensive weapon in war? Partly. And, and partly here it seems to suggest that God doesn't want them ever to go back to Egypt again because mm -hmm. he's afraid they'll pick up bad things from down there, I, I suspect. And they'd run roughshod over the people, too. Mm -hmm. yeah. What's the problem with many wives? Solomon certainly... Uh, Have you tried it? Thought that was, no, I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't dare. <laughs> Solomon learned how true that was at the end yeah. of his life. Yeah. yeah. Very, you know, if you read these, in, these final chapters in, in the book of Deuteronomy, there are a lot of people who can't believe that this was written by Moses because it so specifically points out the sins that are coming up later. They just say, you know, it, it had to be written later. It couldn't have been written back in the days of Moses. And, of course, if you don't think God can foretell the future, then you have to say that. Are you suggesting that God really can foretell the future? I absolutely believe that God can foretell the future. Well, either that or he knows the truth very well. Yes, that too. The future truth. No, not necessarily. There's a lot of things you can predict just by knowing the truth. Like those that live by the sword will die by the sword. Things like that. Well, look at Romans 8. It's a parallel book to the book of Galatians, and it ought to help us here in understanding Galatians. Do you feel like this sometimes? There is no condemnation now for those who live in union with Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit, which brings us life in union with Christ Jesus, has set me free from the law of sin and death. What the law could not do, notice the law could not do, because human nature was weak. What's the problem with the law? Human nature is weak, right? God did. He condemned sin and human nature by sending His own Son, who came with a nature like sinful human nature, to do away with sin. So, that ought to give us some clues. And, and, and look at another place. Look at just Romans 6, uh, 14 and 15, just as a comparison here. Romans 6, 14 and 15. Those are famous verses. Sin must not be your master, for you do not live under law, but under God's grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law, but under God's grace? By no means. In other words, do we still need the law to point out sin? Yeah, we do. Well, how do we get around that problem? And not that we can bypass the law or anything, but... Basically, what we, way we get around that problem is by following the example of Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. So we are under God's grace, but at the same time we still need the law because it points us our sins and keeps us looking for Jesus Christ. Yeah. Well, it's God's plan that by studying the life of Christ, 
we may behold and become changed. There's a very famous quotation um, from Ellen White. It's found in Great Controversy, page 555. And we'll see if we can get there here in a second. I just would like to read it because it's so, so relevant for what we're talking about here. Um, we still need to get over here a little bit more. Okay. It is a law, both of the intellectual and the spiritual nature, that by beholding we become changed. It is a law. Now, what kind of a law? You think this is a descriptive law or a proscriptive law? Descriptive. This is a descriptive law of how the mind actually works. That by beholding, both intellectually and spiritually, by beholding we become changed. The mind gradually adapts itself to the subjects upon which it is allowed to dwell. It becomes assimilated to that which is accustomed to love and reverence. And it goes on. So, um, as we spend time contemplating the life of Christ, we learn to practice good behaviors, and the Holy Spirit, writing the law on our hearts, transforms us into His image, and that's suggested by 2 Corinthians 3.18. This, of course, does not do away with the need for the law. If we get careless or wander into new territory in disobedience, the law will quickly point out what needs to happen and tell us to correct our error. Now, let me see if I can give you an example of that. The law is called our paedagogos. Now, these paedagogoi, these child guides that were responsible for the sons of the Roman and Greek people that day, they had to go with the kids. The, if the kids went to school, they would go along. What did they do at school? What did the paedagogoi do at school? Make sure the kids stay at school. Get them safely to school. Make sure they stay in there and do their lessons and do their homework and everything, and they get safely home. Why was that a problem? Because kidnapping was common at that time. Kidnapping and holding for ransom. Yes. The, there were some 60% of the people living in the Mediterranean world in those days were slaves. And most of them were not slaves in the sense, in modern sense, we would think of a slave there, where you get sold for life to, do so, to somebody. But they're rather people who are in debt or something else like this. So if they could clear their debt, if they could pay off whatever they owed, they would go free. So if you could kidnap somebody's kid who has a lot of money and say, well, give me money and I'll, and I'll, and I'll give your kid back, you're home free, right? So that's why they kept an eye on them while they were in school. That's why these Piedagogoi had to stay right there. I mean, it was their life on the line. It was their life for those kids' lives, and so they had to watch these kids day and night. I mean, that was their job. So how does all this analogize with the law? That's my next question, fairly stated, very well stated. How does that match with what we believe the law does? The law keeps oh, us... The law keeps <laughs> us out of... Out of trouble? The or at least it tries to keep us out of trouble. Yeah, because once we wander away from what is right, which those guidelines keeps us focused on track, on the, on the straight path, then we are susceptible and we're on the ground, enemy's ground. Mm -hmm. So that we're vulnerable to the devil and bondages. Okay. Well, the wages of sin is death, mm -hmm. and sin is a transgression of the law. Okay. So basically it is a boundary... It works as a border to mm -hmm. keep us from death. Mm -hmm. Just and like ultimately, that's what God is trying to do, is keep us from death, trying to watch over His creation. Just like those ancient Pythagoras did. That was their, they, they served as a kind of boundary for those kids. This is what you can do, this is what you can't do, and I'm here to make sure that you do what you're supposed to do and you don't do what you're not supposed to do. It kind of suggests the process there, you know, the sequence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, you've got the, um, what did you call them again? Hidagogoi. <laughs> they take the kids to school, mm -hmm. and it's almost like the school is where Jesus is. Mm -hmm. so the teacher. The teacher, right, mm -hmm. right. So 
you've got the process in the Old Testament as the, the people are being brought to school. And then you've got the time of Jesus where he's a teacher. Mm -hmm. So in a way, it fits that way. But you still need it. When you're in school, you don't really need that whatever, that name again. Pedagogoi. Right. You don't really need him right then when well, they're in school, you, right? Unless, unless you're a kid that tries to get out during recess and instead of going back into school, you want to run away. Or unless there's someone that invades the school and, you know, tries to kidnap you from the school. I mean, yeah, but how does that work with Jesus, though? Well, no, it's, it's not, we're not talking about Jesus here. We're talking about what... Well, yeah, we are because we're trying to see whether the law is, is still in yeah, intact okay. or not. Okay. So if you're out there committing adultery and doing a gazillion other things that you're not supposed to do, you're not focusing on what Jesus wants to teach you. Okay. And the law says, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. Focus on this. So you got a guy with a switch that's going to come in and bop you on the head. If necessary. And um, listen to your teacher. Yeah. So when does that ever change? <laughs> so when do we not need our Pythagogos? I don't think there's ever a time we don't need it. It, it, it terms well, about in the, in the it terms as a boundary. These, these people mature when they no matured, became an adult. Mm -hmm. They no longer had this. Well, they didn't guardian. need it anymore. Presumably, they had gotten so accustomed to living within the right boundaries, the safe boundaries, that they didn't need it anymore. So no. when we learn to live, when we learn to do what's right because it is right. Yeah then we no longer need the law to tell us what's right and That's force right. us to do what's that right. That is correct. Well, the way I think of it is I just think of those boundaries or the law keep pushing us toward the teacher who is Christ. Mm -hmm. It's like yeah. giving us a, a the nudge. Yeah, nudge. Mm -hmm. It's keeping us focused on track on the street. Well, the boundary is very important for sure. And yet there's something very interesting. When Jesus was here on this earth, he seemed to sometimes walk a very fine line between applying the law and applying grace. Let's take a couple of examples. What about the woman at the well in Samaria? What do we know about her? She was not living. She was living in sin. She'd been married five times and the person she was living with now wasn't even her husband. Mm -hmm. We would say she was living in sin, right? Jesus says, you terrible woman, stop what you're doing, and then I'll tell you how you can get saved. No. 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 He offered and, her something. Yeah. Well, he asked for something. Mm -hmm. He asked for her to do something for him. And then what about the woman taken in adultery in John 8? What did he say? After that whole thing was over and she thought she was going to be killed by stoning and so forth, Jesus said, go home and be a better girl from now on. Mm -hmm. Go and sin no more. Yeah. So, uh, are you zeroing in on the school part there when yeah. you say those? Yeah. Okay. But but still, if you get to the point where you don't need the protector, how do you well, still you make only the get argument the that that the protector is still important? If if you decide that you're going to test the boundaries again, the protector is still there. If you're foolish enough, after you know better, to go out there and try it. You mean even after Jesus has taught you? Even after Jesus has taught you. Let me give an example. I had a patient come to me to see me, and some, most of you perhaps know, or some of you know, that I'm a physician. I take care of patients every day. And um, this young lady had come into my office, and she wanted to be tested for all kind of sexually transmitted infections. And so the, young, the, the resident that I was working with said, well, why is that? Well, she says, I have this boyfriend, and I'm not sure if I can trust him, so now I have another boyfriend, and I'm not sure if I can trust him, so I'm thinking about getting a third boyfriend all at the same time. So I need to make sure that I don't have any bad infections. Well, here's an adult woman. What's she doing? She's testing the boundaries. There's no question about it. She's, and if we decide we want to do that kind of stuff, the law says, no, you're not supposed to do that. Well, Jesus would say that too, wouldn't he? Yes. Where does it say, no, you're not supposed to do that? 
Well, you know, thou shalt not the law. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Okay, so you're elaborating more. Okay. Yeah. Well, what about what? What about if some people say, "Well, you know, I hear this about um, the boundaries or the law, trying to keep us focused mm -hmm. and keep us on Christ, the teacher." Mm -hmm. What about if some people or someone might say, "Christ is an." Christ is, is not sufficient. What is Christ not sufficient that He needs those borders to point us to Him? Well, He tries to attract us, and if we're attracted, we are drawn to Him, and so forth. That's all we need, no question about it. If we turn and run from Him, he, God doesn't give up on us. He says, even out there, there are boundaries. We'll try to turn you back, but God will not force us. He's not. Coercion is not God's plan. You know, it's almost like when you're coming to the school, you, you know the rules, but you don't really understand them. But, but you obey. When you get into the, into the school, the teacher teaches you what those rules are about so you understand them. Mm -hmm. okay. And then when you understand them, well, then you do them because they're right, not because... Okay. Not because the person is doing it because somebody gave you some rule to follow. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, so there's somebody outside of the big stick that'll. So these these rules that you had to follow are still there, but now you understand them mm -hmm. and you value them. You do you them because it's the right to, thing to do. Is, yeah, it's the right thing, to, and you understand it is not because somebody told you. That understanding that went on up here, and now it's part of you. That the law is written on your heart. Yeah. Okay. Right? So if you if you throw away that law, you're kind of throwing away the basis for what Jesus is teaching in the first place. Or what protects us. The protection. Yeah. Or the protects us. I think us. if anybody would have wanted to change the law, it would have been God. Considering um, he did not want to sacrifice Christ for the sake of mm -hmm. saving yeah. the human race, that the the greatest argument against you know the breaking of the law is that Jesus came and died as a substitute um, in order to save us from sin. Sin is a transgression of the law, and had. God been able to change the law or alter it in any way, a jot or even a tittle, Christ would not need come down to this earth to die mm -hmm. for our sins. It. He could have changed. He, if anybody wanted to change it, it would have been him. And I'm sure God would have preferred to change the law than to send his son to die for our sins. But you don't say that the... That Christ came down to change the law, that since he's been here, it changes the law. He's actually come down to fulfill the law and to teach us more about the law to actually, so we can understand the law. It's not just a, a rule book anymore. It's something we, we understand the basic mm -hmm. things well, that put those rules Christ together. Christ was sinless and he kept the Sabbath. So mm -hmm. it, had he not kept the Sabbath, he would have been condemned as a sinner. He well, would have some become a sinner. Well, some people might say, well, he had to because he was, you know, under the old covenant. Yeah, but we're saying that when, you, when he is a teacher, he's actually fulfilling the law mm -hmm, mm -hmm. by being the teacher, by showing us what it is, yeah. what the law is all about. It's the duty of the parent is to teach their kids. And he says, I'll teach you how to pray, our Father who art in heaven. It's a parent-child relationship. That's one way of looking at it. Well, he's our blueprint. Obviously, he's back in heaven. That should tell us a, big, a great deal of how to get there. You know, he's our roadmap. Well, I'm going to bring one more thing in before we run out of time. Our lesson quotes a couple of places, in a couple of different places here, from the chapter entitled The Law in Galatians in the little book, Selected Messages, Book One. <clears throat> and it jumps over a section that I would like to read. In 1888, the delegates to the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists, meeting at Minneapolis, Minnesota, struggled with the issue we're talking about in this lesson. Two small books have been written on the subject. One was written by G.I. Butler, 
the president of the General Conference, and his little book was entitled The Law in Galatians. The other was written by E.J. Wagoner, a young physician theologian and one of the co-editors of the Signs of the Times in those days. Butler believed that the law referred to in Galatians 3 was a ceremonial law only. Dr. Wagner believed that it referred primarily to the moral law. Ellen White pointed out that it means both. She had some very serious words about the consequences of that disagreement. They ended up having pretty serious conflicting ideas there at that Minneapolis General Conference. And these are the words that she says about that. An unwillingness to yield up preconceived opinions and to accept this truth, and you can speculate about what that is, is talking about what law there is in Galatians and what's the function of that law, lay at the foundation of a large share of the opposition manifested at Minneapolis against the Lord's message to brethren E.J. Wagner and A.T. Jones. By exciting that opposition, Satan succeeded in shutting away from our people, in a great measure, the special power of the Holy Spirit. Now, if I were to ask you, okay, at the end of time, the Bible describes a special outpouring of the Holy Spirit. What do we call that? The latter rain. The latter rain. Why do we call it the latter rain? As opposed to the former rain at the day of Pentecost. Okay, and the, what happened at the former rain? Thousands were converted. Peter preached the gospel shortly after, well, at Pentecost, shortly after the death and resurrection of Jesus, and thousands of people came flocking in, right? So we take that to suggest that what's going to happen in the latter rain? The Holy Spirit will be poured out. The Holy Spirit will be poured the out again, and what, what do we expect to see happen? Forward. Many people come back yeah. converts. Well, this was the special power of the Holy Spirit that God longed to impart to them. God was waiting to give us the special power of the Holy Spirit. What happened? The enemy prevented, who would be the enemy? Satan. Satan. The enemy prevented them from obtaining that efficiency which might have been theirs in carrying the truth to the world as the apostles proclaimed it after the day of Pentecost. Is that pretty clear what we're talking about? Efficiency? Well, the efficiency and the, the apostles proclaiming it after the day of Pentecost, isn't that clearly referring to the former reign? Yes. Mm -hmm. Clearly suggesting that the one she's talking about now is the latter reign, right? I want to be very clear about this. The light that is to lighten the whole earth with its glory was resisted. Okay, what's the light that is supposed to lighten the whole world with its glory? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit coming out, and don't we, don't we, doesn't the book of Revelation portray that as one of the events that's going to happen at the end of the world? Yes. Okay. But what caused it from not, from being? That. The enemy prevented them, these would be the people at the I general know, conference. Specifically, how? Did he well, prevent them? Well, we're going to get to that in the next paragraph, so right. hang on. So, as you uh, say, the light that has lightened the whole earth with his glory was resisted, and by the action of our own brethren has been in a great degree kept away from the world. Does that suggest that the gospel could have been finished, the world could have come to, end, to an end more than a hundred years ago? Yes. Sounds like it. Sure. Mm -hmm. Sounds like it. What happened? It was delayed. The plan was short circuited. The plan was short circuited. And why are we a hundred and man, I don't even know, what is it, hundred almost hundred and twenty five years later, we're still here. Is the is the plan still being short circuited? Sure. Yes. Sure. Seems like it, doesn't it? Well what was the problem? The question Gary asked. The law of Ten Commandments, now that's what we've been talking about, right? We've been talking about the function of the law, right? The law of the ten, of ten Commandments is not to be looked upon as much from the prohibitory side as from the mercy side. What's the mercy side of the Ten Commandments? Protection. Hmm? Protection? Protection. Okay. And it forms that boundary we've been talking about, that 
sort of fence. Don't go here. You'll be in trouble. You'll cause all kinds of problems. Stay away from there. Stick with Christ. Go back to the center. Don't go out there to the, to the edges, right? So it's a preoccupation with doing something wrong. Yeah, would that be would be one way of putting it. Also his grace. Mm -hmm. Well, it says its prohibitions, this would be the thou shalt nots in the law, right? Are the sure guarantee of happiness and obedience. Have you thought about the thou shalt nots in the Bible as being the sure guarantee of happiness and obedience? That's what the prohibitions oh. really are meant to be for. Yeah. Yeah, so we children never know what, way, what the limits so. are. Following those guidelines are the guarantee of happiness. Yeah. That's a new way to look at yeah. that. Just like a parent mm -hmm. to a child relationship. Is your child being legalistic if they obey you when you tell them to take out the trash? Is that legalism? I hope not. You know, if, if your child loves you, they will obey and honor what you tell them to do. Yeah. And in the same way we are to do that with God. She goes on, as received in Christ, it works in us the purity of character that will bring joy to us through eternal ages. As received in Christ. What's being received in Christ? The not. The truth about the Ten Commandments, right? Right. Um, to the obedient, it is a wall of protection. Now she's saying that boundary out there is what? Not just a law, a bunch of prohibitions. It's a wall of protection. Our well-being. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We behold in it the goodness of God who by revealing to men the immutable principles of righteousness seeks to shield them from the evils that result from transgression. So that's the mercy side. Mm -hmm. that's well, and we haven't quite finished all of it. We have a few more verse, words to read. We are not, notice that, we are not to regard God as waiting to punish the sinner for his sin. How many think of God as waiting to punish, to punish the sinner for his sin? A lot. Most of the world. Most I used to have someone in one of my classes, a little bit like this, it was, we met in a, a private home, and this gentleman was a Roman Catholic as a child, and he said he used to pray that he would be run over by a car on his way home from church on Sunday morning, because he thought that was the only time when his law, his, 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 his character was close enough to God's will that he might possibly make it to heaven. So the rest of the week, he had already committed too many sins, and he had, then on Sunday morning, he'd go and he'd confess his sins, and on the way home, he thought, let me run, be run over right now, you know? How sad. Yeah. We are not to regard God as waiting to punish the sinner for his sins. The sinner brings the punishment upon himself. This is a, is this talking about descriptive laws now or proscriptive laws? Descriptive. These are descriptive laws. His own actions start a train of circumstances that bring the sure result. Are these consequences or are these punishments? Consequences. consequences. These are consequences. Every act of transgression reacts upon the sinner, works in him a change of character, and makes it more easy for him to transgress again. By choosing to sin, men separate themselves from God cut themselves off from the channel of blessing and the sure result, the punishment or the sure result? Sure result. The sure result is ruin and death. What's she describing there? The consequences. Consequences, consequences let, of us separating ourselves from God. Let me, uh, let me just uh, In read other you. In words, the, the wages of sin is death. Yeah. Well, let me read you another verse that, that fits with that. It's found in Romans 14, 23. And it's one of the, this is, I believe, the most basic description of sin in all the Bible. There are, there are three verses in the New Testament that clearly try to describe sin. 1 John 3, 4 is the one that you've quoted several times. Most people know sin is a transgression of the law. Literally, it's hamartia, the Greek word for sin, estin anomia, lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness or sin is rebelliousness. That's, that's the basic meaning of that verse. Then in James 4, 17, it says, whatsoever we, if, if we know to do what is right and we don't do it, that's sin. Okay? It's another definition of sin. But I like this one here. I think it's much more basic. 
if people have doubts about what they eat, God condemns them when they eat it, and it's been, he's been talking about food being offered to idols here and, and, and whether it's safe to eat it. But so if you have doubts about what you're doing, God condemns you when you do it because your action is not based on faith. And anything that is not based on faith is sin. What's he saying? We've suggested that faith is a relationship with God as with a friend, right? So if faith is going to bring you closer and closer to whom? God. And sin takes you where? Further away. Further away. We read from Ellen White, it says sin, you know. Separates. Separates. Go back over there. Um, sorry, here I was reading from a different place here. Let's go back here for just a second. Yeah. By choosing to sin, men separate themselves from God, cut themselves off from the channel of blessing, and the sure result is ruin and death. So, I, I, I think there's a very clear picture here. We were so hung up in 1888 with, we're the true church, we keep all the Ten Commandments, we observe the Sabbath, we're the saints, we don't even tell us what to do, you know. We're going to do this even if it kills us. And she's saying, no, we should have the attitude that, you know, if we, if we disobey, it, we're cutting ourselves off. We need to turn to God. We need to come back to Jesus. We need to focus on Him. So, honestly now, how do we look at the law in our day? Do we see the law as full of mercy? Did our own General Conference brethren back in 1888 actually turn back the latter rain? Could the gospel have gone forward and been finished more than 100 years ago? Could that happen today? Could that happen now? Have we really learned our lesson? That's the question. Do we understand the relationship between this law, this, this boundary, this wall of protection that's out there? Do we understand that relationship, how it relates to Christ, who should be the center of our world, the one that we're attracted to, the one we, are, we, we come toward? And it's our challenge to you to think about that for yourself, and we'll plan to see you next week.